Hey everybody, welcome to part two of our Chilled Logic Puck build. In part one, we focused on assembling the frame, and in this video, we'll be finishing the light and doing some testing. We'll check PPFD at a couple different heights, see what sort of temperatures the pucks run at, and have a look at how evenly the pucks split the driver current in this parallel configuration. As always, I like to lay everything out before I get started just so I can get a rough plan together for the build. You might have noticed that since the first video, I've brought the rails in a little bit to get my lights a touch closer to center, and I did this because I had done some preliminary PPFD testing before finishing the light so I could make sure that I'm getting good even coverage across a 4x4 space, and taking the light rails in about 3 inches did the trick. For this light, I'm using a 4 inch by 4 inch PVC box from Home Depot to hide my Wago splices on the DC side, and I'll be home running each of the pucks back to this box, which means that each will get its own cable run directly back to the driver. I'm using 18-2 stranded cable, which means that the cable is made up of two insulated 18 gauge conductors wrapped in a single jacket. This will work nicely to carry both my positive and negative signal in one run. Since the cable's stranded, I'll be tinning the ends with solder just to make them behave more like solid core cable in the connectors. When I went to mount my splice box, as expected, the mounting holes didn't quite line up with my driver's support rails, so I had to make my own holes to fit. I used two of the pre-made holes, and then just drilled two new holes inside the box itself to line up with the rail. In order to get a nice grip on the wires coming in and out of the splice box, I used these half-inch cable glands. With these, you just pass your cable through the hole, and when you tighten it up, the gland will squeeze down on the cable jacket, and provide a nice strain relief. I used one cable gland for each of the two driver output leads and for the last set of wires coming off the driver I just drilled a hole in the box to pass it through since it's too small to clamp with any of the cable glands that I could find locally. On the HLG 600H these three conductors are the remote turn off positive and negative and a conductor that carries 5 volts that you can use to power other circuits. I'll just be capping these all off with Wagos. To install the glands you just drill a hole push the assembly through, and then tighten up a plastic nut on the inside. On the other side of the box, I drilled two holes for two more cable glands. I'll be sending three of my 18-2 cables through each of these pass-throughs. With all the cable pass-throughs complete, I was ready to fasten the box down, so I threw some hammerhead T-nuts on, screwed the box into place on the rails, and then tightened up the cable glands with a crescent wrench. Now it was time to get my wire cut to length. I left some length on either end to allow me to do a tiny little service loop. Service loops are nice to have in case you ever make a mistake or damage the cable, since you'll have some extra length that you can use as an emergency backup. The amount that I left hardly qualifies as a loop, but it's a few extra inches anyway. In order to provide a little more protection to the wire and to make the light look a lot cleaner, I decided to sock my cable with this half inch braided sleeve. The half inch size fits three 18-2 cables nicely. I had to poke the cable out for the first couple lights in the chain, so I used a lighter to burn holes in the sleeve at the locations I needed to pass cable through. Burning this stuff is better than cutting it, because it won't fray if you burn it. If you cut it, it turns into a big mess pretty quickly. You are going to have to make some cuts though, and to clean up the frayed ends on the sock, you can just fold it back in on itself for a nicer finish. To fasten the wire snake down to the rails I used tie wraps. The cable bundle tucked nicely into the T-slots in the rail. In the splice box I trimmed the sleeve back and taped it into place. I'm going to do a little service loop inside the box to relieve stress on the cable and the extra cable will make it easier for me to test the current as well. I left the cable long to start with just to make testing easier and then I cut it down a little bit shorter when I was finished with my testing and cleaned it up with some heat shrink which I'll get to in a bit. The cable that I'm working with has a string that runs the length of it and if you want to remove the jacket the safe way without risking nicking the conductors inside with a pair of strippers, you just use the string as a rip cord and then cut it and cut the jacket wherever you need. This driver has two sets of output leads so I'm going to split the pucks up and put three of them on each set of leads. These leads are paralleled inside the driver but you get two sets of them on the big drivers just to help split your runs up so you don't have all the current from the driver on a single positive and negative lead. 
With a 600H like this one, that would be a buttload of current. On the AC side, I'm using an LLT-L20 connector, which provides waterproofing and strain relief. This connector was made pretty popular in the DIY world by HLG, who includes it in their quantum board kits. With these connectors, you need to make sure that your wire conductors are trimmed short enough that the connector clamps down on the thick black jacket of the wire, and not on the three exposed conductors. The conductors on my AC cable were the right length, but I had to trim down the conductors on the driver's AC leads and then restrip them. There are three color screw terminals on this connector, a black one, a silver one, and a copper one. I like to use the black one for my hot wire, the silver for my neutral, and the copper one for my ground. On the driver's side you get a brown wire, a blue wire, and a green wire. The brown is hot, the blue is neutral, and the green is ground. On my AC power cable the three wires are black, white, and green. So in this case black is hot, white is neutral, and green is ground. So I'm going to be connecting the driver brown wire to the cable black wire using the black terminal on the connector, then the driver blue wire to the cable white wire using the silver terminal, and the driver green wire to the cable green wire using the connector's copper terminal. To connect the pucks, I measured out the cable and marked where I wanted to cut and strip to. The chilled data sheet for these pucks states that you can use stranded cable, but you have to tin it with solder. I used heat shrink to clean up the end of the jacket, and since I had some different colors, I color coded my wires just to make them easier to identify at the other end. On each side, I made the first light in the chain red, the second green, and the third blue, and then matched these colors up on the other end of the wire in the splice box when I was done my testing and ready to close everything up. So that covers the build component for this light. It's simple, strong, and I think it looks pretty sharp too. I really like the 2020 extrusion for this because it's very strong and rigid and there are plenty of accessories available for it, and it's easily customizable. The pucks were very easy to adapt to it with some aluminum angle, and the channel provides a nice way to manage your cable too. Since this is a parallel build, I was eager to see how the current from the driver will be divvied up between the pucks. Now I'm going to ramble a bit about parallel before I get to the results. In a parallel build, the voltage being fed to each of the pucks is going to be about the same, but the current the pucks pull is going to vary, and that'll depend on how much each of the pucks draws. This is based on the individual IV curves of each puck, with the I standing for current and the V standing for voltage, which is the relationship of how much current an LED or an array of LEDs will draw when it has a certain voltage placed across it, or vice versa. In parallel builds using constant voltage drivers, it's sort of a common misconception that these constant voltage drivers are always going to be outputting 100% of their power. Even though the HLG 600H driver I'm using here is rated for 48 volts and 12.5 amps, it's not necessarily going to be producing 12.5 amps unless I get the load on the circuit, in this case the pucks, to draw that current out of the driver. For example, if I left the current pot cranked to max on the driver, but set the voltage down to say only 40 volts, the pucks would not be pulling full current from this driver. However, in this build, we're going to have no problem getting full current out of the driver because the pucks are going to pull it all before we even get to about 45 volts. Things do get a little more complicated when you add in the fact that the IV curve of an LED shifts as the temperature increases, which can cause the LED to pull more current at the same voltage and the fact that Meanwhile's constant voltage HLG series drivers are actually considered constant voltage plus constant current. But delving into this is getting beyond the scope of the video. You do need to know what you're doing when you go parallel though because there are risks involved and if you're looking for a more in-depth explanation of how parallel and constant voltage plus constant current systems work, check out our deep dive videos on this topic that I feel explain it pretty well. They're linked in the description. One of the main fears when running parallel is that one of your pucks or strips or cobs or whatever you're using will go into thermal runaway. 
Thermal runaway is what happens when an LED heats up, which causes it to draw more current, which heats it up more, causing it to draw more current, and then this cycle repeats until it destroys itself. Since current is not regulated in a parallel build, it's possible that one of your devices will hog more than its share of current from the driver and go thermal. In my experience, I've only been able to get this to happen by actually trying to make it happen, and I've run a lot of parallel setups without issue, but this doesn't mean that it won't happen to you, so keep this in mind when running parallel. I didn't have any issues with current hogging when running this light though, and the pucks did play nice together. To see how the pucks split the drive current, I turned the driver up to full blast and measured the current being pulled by each puck individually after being run for 20 minutes, 2 hours, 4 hours, and 12 hours. I used a clamp ammeter to do this which made current really easy to measure. This is the first time I've used this particular meter and I was really impressed with how accurate it was. If I zeroed it nicely, it would read within just a few milliamps of my much more expensive Fluke 287 meter without having to break the circuit to measure. I'd highly recommend using this meter if you're looking for a budget meter to use for DIY LED stuff and I've linked to it in the video description as well. So here's what I got for results. As you can see, the system was very stable. There is some slight variation in current consumed by each puck, but we're looking at a difference of about 300 milliamps at most, which isn't terrible. The likelihood of these things splitting current totally equally is very low, and some variance is to be expected. What I was most concerned about was whether these numbers would change over time. If one puck started hogging more current than the rest as the system heated up, we might see the dreaded thermal runaway happening, but I saw no evidence of this happening in my test, nor have I seen it any time I've run this light since the test. Over the full 12 hours of testing, each of these pucks only fluctuated within about 30 or 40 milliamps, so they were rock solid. One thing to note with this build is that there's a chance some pucks will pull more than the max rated current for each puck, which chilled states is 2300 milliamps. The fix for this would be to limit the current on the driver just by turning the IO adjust down a little bit on the A version or turning your pot down a bit if you're using the B version of the driver. You could also just add a couple pucks to split the current up too. I also monitored voltage throughout my current test period and found that the driver voltage hovered around 43.3 volts once it got warm enough. This is another thing that freaks people out quite often. They'll see their constant voltage driver that's rated for 48 volts running at 45 volts or 43 volts and think that it's faulty, but it's not. It's just running in constant current mode because its current output has been maxed out. When this happens, the voltage drops depending on the LEDs that you have hooked up. Again, this is a topic for another entire video itself, and I encourage you to check out our other in-depth video on this topic if you're looking for a better understanding. As I was testing current, I was also monitoring temperature, and after running full tilt for 4 hours, the pucks that were drawing the most current measured about 58 to 60 degrees, while the pucks drawing less current measured about 52 to 55 degrees. To give you an idea of how hot this is, I was able to keep my hand on the heatsink for about 5 to 10 seconds before it was too uncomfortable and I had to pull it away. The temps I recorded were with no direct airflow on the heatsinks and just an exhaust fan and a small circulating fan running in the tent. The temp on each puck could be reduced by blowing air over them with a fan or by circulating more air in the tent. The last parameter I tested was PPFD. I checked at both 24 inches and 18 inches and the numbers were pretty damn impressive. As mentioned, in some preliminary testing I found that having the pucks pushed all the way out to the end of the frame was not producing enough light in the center of the tent, so I shifted each of the rails inwards by about 3 inches and this evened things out nicely. Right now, you're looking at an overlay of how my lights were laid out to get these measurements. I ended up spacing each puck about 15 inches center to center from one another on the rails and then about 26 and a half inches from center to center in the opposite direction across the light. When you're testing in an actual grow tent, it can be tricky to get even numbers in all the corners and the sides just because of all the variables introduced in a grow tent. No matter how many measurements you take to center the light, you're always bound to get some oddball readings in certain places and you know, maybe the tent wall comes in more on one side or it wrinkles a funny way near the floor in one corner. 
but for consistency's sake, I decided just to keep the raw data that I recorded while testing rather than averaging it out to make the numbers look more even. So there are a few outlier numbers on the chart that kind of made me go, what? But so be it. I did calculate an average for each of the perimeters I measured though, and you can find these on the right. So in a one foot by one foot space, the light averaged 850 micromoles at 24 inches and 900 at 18 inches. Moving out to a two foot by two foot perimeter, the 24 inch height was averaging about 850 micromoles and at 18 inches it was 925. At the edge of a three foot by three foot space, I got an average of 725 micromoles at 24 inches and 790 micromoles at 18 inches. Finally, at the edge of the tent, which worked out to be an actual measurement of about 46 by 46 inches, I saw an average of 650 micromoles at 24 inches and 710 micromoles at 18 inches. If I take the average of all 33 measurements at each height, I get a tent wide average of 760 micromoles per meter square per second at 24 inches and 830 at 18 inches, which I think is awesome. That's a good chunk of flower power in a 4x4 with a really nice spread. I had posted on Instagram before this video looking for some guesses on what the 24 inch average would be and shout out to Grometheus who is less than 20 micromoles off of the final result with his guess of 777. Nicely done. So that'll do it for this build. After playing with these pucks over the past few months, I think that they're awesome little PCBs that are very flexible. They do require a fair bit of work to assemble unless you buy a frame from Rapid LED or get the all-in-one versions that hang individually. But I think building is half the fun of DIY and I really enjoy designing, sourcing, and assembling all the parts for these lights. If you're looking to flower a 4x4, I think the six puck chilled design that we tested in this video is a good option for those who lean towards more of a budget build that runs harder on fewer parts than a, a pure efficiency build. You could realize some considerable gains in efficiency if you added more pucks to this build and ran them softer on the same driver, but the extra pucks, heat sinks, and 2020 would definitely drive that cost up. Six pucks running flat out still do a fantastic job of providing high intensity and surprisingly even coverage over a 4x4 as seen in our tests though, and I'm eager to see how the next generation of these Logic PCBs do in the same configuration. As always, thanks for watching guys, and please consider subscribing for more DIY LED builds, theory, experiments, and reviews, and we'll see you next time.